So, <laughs> um, nice to be nice to be back, uh, and particularly this is really a panel I would have come down to hear. Uh, so I was particularly pleased uh, to have the opportunity to moderate it. Now, two days ago, people were telling me I sounded like Lauren Bacall. Now people are just saying, you're really sick, aren't you? So I'm sorry for the, the frog-like uh, quality to my voice. This panel is about defining a strategic partnership. Right after uh, the, the Secretary Clinton became Secretary of State, somebody had the idea of figuring out how many strategic partnerships uh, were in existence and how to define them. After a week or two, we gave up on this completely. There are many different types of strategic partnership, uh, and there is no one definition. But for our purposes, that's actually a good thing, because what, what that means is that really thinking about what uh, ought to characterize the U.S.-Singapore strategic partnership is much more a function of the context uh, and the specific long-term relations between the United States and Singapore than any formal notion of a strategic partnership. We've got uh, a wonderful opportunity to hear from both Peter Ho and from uh, Kurt Campbell, but before I introduce them, which I'm going to do very briefly, I, I want to talk for a minute uh, about the pivot to Asia, which we're going to hear more about, uh, but also maybe try to broaden that out a bit and just put a couple of, of topics on the table. Um, the first thing to note uh, is, of course, it is a pivot to Asia, not to China, uh, not to Northeast Asia. Indeed, when I first heard it, I thought to myself uh, exactly of the U.S.-Singapore strategic dialogue because my first encounter with ASEAN, with really uh, uh, many people coming from ASEAN, was in Singapore at courtesy of Kurt and with, with Ambassador Ang Chi Chan. And the role that ASEAN plays and that Singapore plays in particular have been very important, I know, in Kurt's thinking uh, and very much a part of the, of the uh, uh, pivot uh, to Asia. We're probably going to be focusing more on the grand strategy, on the geopolitics, uh, on China, on, on regional organizations generally, on the East Asia Summit, and I'll leave that uh, for the discussion. But I also wanted to just note, at the same time, with much less fanfare, Secretary Clinton has implemented what I would call a pivot to the people, uh, a pivot to a whole set of, of policies that are focused on individuals and not on states. Actually, we just saw a tremendous example of that with her in the UN Security Council last week. She was speaking directly to the Syrian people. It was very clear. She was taking the opportunity to engage the Syrian people. That was obviously in a sort of more traditional form, but there have been many, many policies, and many of them actually done uh, in East Asia and Pacific affairs, uh, engaging entrepreneurs, engaging women, engaging youth groups, uh, reaching out to Muslim communities, thinking about environmental initiatives, things like the Mekong Initiative, uh, which has happened uh, under Kurt's watch, bringing together uh, nations, but really bringing together uh, people uh, and groups and foundations and universities as well as governments. Uh, so I'm going to put that on the table because I hope in discussing the U.S.-Singapore strategic partnership, we focus on some of those issues as well. Singapore's incredible technological edge makes it a natural partner for any number of the, the new technology initiatives the State Department uh, is, is initiating. And simply Singapore as a model for development uh, is, has tremendous implications for how the U.S. and Singapore can partner on development initiatives throughout Asia, again, as well as on the sort of grander geopolitical uh, terrain. So with that, uh, I, you have the long int uh, introductions. I'm going to ask uh, Peter Ho to speak first. Uh, he is now, uh, he says he's a retired pensioner uh, with his characteristic modesty. Uh, he's the senior advisor uh, for the Center for Strategic Futures uh, and the senior fellow at the Civil Service College. Of course, you know that he was the head of Singapore's civil service for many years. Uh, he's not exactly uh, sinking, it's, taking it easy in retirement. I actually think the work that he is doing on strategic futures uh, is really cutting edge, uh, and it's something that the United States is already looking to Singapore on. And uh, then my 
old friend, Kurt Campbell. Kurt said, it's much better that you introduce me casually. And so I'm thinking, well, which of the stories from Oxford would, should I tell? Uh, I think probably none, probably none of them. That's what I thought. <laughs> so he is our Assistant Secretary uh, for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. I, I'm not flattering him when I say that under his tenure, uh, our policy toward the region has been uh, really central to American foreign policy. There are so many different things that have been launched. Obviously, the very high profile uh, initiatives, the entire focus on the pivot to Asia, uh, th the opening of Burma, I could go on, but also things like 100,000 Strong, which under Kurt, uh, sending 100,000 uh, students uh, to China, working again at that level as well as at the geopolitical level. So this is, again, all on the record. I'm going to ask Peter Ho to speak first, and then we'll hear from Kurt. Uh, thank you, Anne-Marie. Well, this is not just about defining a strategic partnership. It's about defining a 21st century strategic partnership. So let's look at the title. And implicit in this title is the notion that the 21st century is different from the 20th century. And indeed, in many ways, the 21st century does look markedly different from the 20th century, which for most part was defined by clear alliances and in, la in the latter half by a bipolar world divided between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies. But the clarity of the bipolar world has given way to something messier, and I think earlier speakers uh, touched on this uh, in greater detail. And in this 21st century, China is rapidly acquiring the comprehensive attributes of a world power political, economic, and military within a short period of time. And the rise of China has created a new strategic dynamic because it challenges the dominance of the United States. The rebalancing of power between an established power and a rising power is a complex process fraught with dangers. Clearly, we need a fresh approach to deal with the resulting stresses and strains and to help ensure that the relations between the US and China are on a stable footing. What role can a small island state like Singapore play in this regard? It is a question that goes to the heart of any strategic partnership between our two countries in the 21st century. Now, Singapore has a vital interest in maintaining good relations and indeed in strengthening them with both the US and China. This is not a new interest. The US, US and China are both critical stakeholders in Asia, and both must be engaged in a constructive way. In this regard, it is not in the interest of any that we pursue an exclusive relationship with one at the expense of the other. We also see a stable relationship between the US and China as a sine qua non for a peaceful and prosperous region. Since the Vietnam War, Singapore has argued, often against the tide of popular opinion, that the US military presence in Asia is vital for regional peace and stability. This position is unchanged. My colleague Gary Ang touched on the Strategic Framework Agreement in his remarks. Now, the SFA actually started off as a conversation that I had with Richard Lawless over lunch in Singapore in 2003. Much of the conversation centered on the concept of Singapore as a hub and how the application of that concept could help support the US military presence in the region by tapping into Singapore's strengths as a major regional and global transport, communications and logistics hub. By then, the US concept of places, not bases, had begun to gain traction. The US was looking for lily pads around the world to reflect the increasingly uncertain and unpredictable operating environment in which threats could emerge from anywhere, almost without warning. This lunch conversation led to the SFA, 
But the SFA is not about setting up a lily pad in Singapore. Looking back, it was really an attempt to modernize the strategic defense relationship between the US and Singapore that had been defined by the 1990 MOU, and I think Gary Ang explained what that was. In conceptualizing Singapore as a hub, an important idea had emerged that in an increasingly globalized world, it is the hub that can provide leverage, extend reach, and amplify impact within a larger network or system. Through the SFA, the US, a global superpower with global interests, would benefit from a partnership with Singapore, a regional and global hub. In turn, Singapore's strategic interests would be served by strengthening the US military presence in the region. The SFA would clearly be a major element in a 21st century strategic partnership between the US and Singapore. But the underlying wisdom of a strategic partnership in the 21st century must be that it does not call for the partners to choose sides. Instead, it must enable the partners to work together to advance their mutual interests in a coherent and coordinated fashion on the one hand, and on the other hand, to provide enough flexibility and maneuvering room to allow them to pursue their separate interests with other partners. In other words, a strategic partnership should be special, but not exclusive. The SFA's conceptual underpinning of a global superpower partnering with a global hub in a globalizing world to advance mutual interests can be extended to a broader strategic partnership between the US and Singapore. Globalization is the overlay on the massive geopolitical changes that I touched on in my preceding remarks. In profound ways, globalization is creating a borderless world. The world we now live in is much more of a networked world rather than a world divided. It is the flat world that Tom Friedman has written extensively on. There's another metaphor used by Richard Florida, who argues that the world is spiky. His argument is that the higher value added activities are densely concentrated and clustered in hubs. The world's economic geography is dominated by hubs that are the focal points of opportunity, growth and innovation. The distribution of economic activity around the world reflects this pattern. Singapore today, both a regional as well as a global hub, we are a connector hub, a hub within the East Asian and Southeast Asian region, and with a high number of links to cities in other regions. We are a hub not because of our size, but because of our centrality, that is, many cities and hubs around the world are linked to one another through Singapore. Singapore, the country, has been cooperating with the US for a long time and has deep and enduring partnerships exemplified by things like the US-Singapore FTA. But there are also new possibilities for partnering Singapore, the hub, in the 21st century there is enormous potential to deal with the challenges and tap into the opportunities that have been created as a result of globalization. Singapore, the hub, can be tapped by the US to take advantage of its connectivity to other hubs, both large and small, in the region and around the world. Beyond the military arena, Singapore, the hub, suggests possibilities for collaboration in new and emerging areas of strategic interest. It seems to me that there are many new areas in which the US and Singapore can develop and enlarge the agenda for cooperation by thinking of Singapore as a hub rather than just looking at cooperation with Singapore as a country. The nature of conflict is changing. Steven Pinker, in his important new book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, has argued that violence is on the decline around the world. Whether you are convinced by Pinker's arguments or not, conflict other than war is much more likely today. Non-traditional threats like cyber threats, piracy, terrorism, nuclear proliferation 
are today as much the preoccupation of defence and security planners around the world as are the traditional threats of military conflict. The global nature of the cyber threat clearly requires countries to work together. Recent hacking attacks against South Korean and the US government websites suggest that the next generation of cyber threats will be much more targeted and perhaps even more lethal. The Stuxnet attacks on the Iran nuclear program highlights the reality that the physical world is not insulated against threats emanating out of cyberspace. Singapore is a major global telecommunications and IT hub with well-developed infrastructure supported by strong policies and organizations to provide and promote cybersecurity. There are opportunities to shift our limited cooperation in cybersecurity into a higher gear as a compact and well-regulated system, but one that is connected to the rest of the world, Singapore could be considered as a test bed for new cybersecurity technologies. Already, the Singapore government funds such work in terms of research, test bedding, and policy implementation. Much more can be achieved if such work is done in partnership, and this approach could also be applied to non-security areas such as data analytics. But the role of governments in a strategic partnership need not be to carry out such cooperation. Instead, it could be to just establish a framework for collaboration and to signal politically to the private sector that such cooperation would be strongly supported. Cooperation can be extended into other areas like humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, or HADR. And in this regard, the virtues of Singapore, the hub, with excellent logistics facilities and good communications and transport links to the region are relevant to HADR, which the military is increasingly expected to play a major role. Singapore is located at the epicenter, almost literally, of a region that is prone to natural disasters such as earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis, and yet is not directly affected by them. It makes a lot of sense, in my view, to run HADR operations out of Singapore, where equipment and supplies can be stored and shipped out quickly in an emergency, as was done after the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami and for other disasters in the region. In fact, Singapore is already the centre for regional oil spill response, which is a disaster of the man-made kind. Under international agreement, dispersants and equipment to fight oil spills are stored in Singapore and deployed whenever there is a spill in the region. The same approach could be adopted for HADR, with the additional benefit of being able to command and control such operations out of the purpose-built Changi Command and Control Center at the Changi Naval Base. Singapore is already an attractive global R&D hub. US academia and industry find value in using Singapore as a hub for research in the Asia-Pacific region. Significant collaboration already exists in the medical and life sciences arena. The Duke NUS Graduate School of Medicine, which has a strong research emphasis, could become a global model of R&D excellence. MIT is also collaborating with Singapore in the research of infectious diseases. Together with the Duke NUS Graduate School of Medicine, this has significantly boosted the number of high-quality people working on infectious diseases in Singapore. But other than our human talent and a well-organized environment for medical and life sciences research, Singapore is attractive because researchers can study the big Asian phenotypes, ethnic Chinese, ethnic Indians, Malays, in one place, Singapore. And I think the Minister for Trade and Industry alluded to this in his remarks. In fact, doing medical research in Asia is essential because Asians respond differently to drugs and to treatments from the West. We are, in microcosm, in Singapore, representative, a hub of the giant Asian markets. Singapore is also the proverbial canary in the Asian mineshaft of infectious diseases that emanate from the tropics, such as H5N1 bird flu. I think it's H5N1. Or 
H5N1. Unfortunately, the last big G2G collaboration between the US and Singapore in the medical arena was the Regional Emerging Disease Institute already, which aimed to study pathogens that could cause a pandemic in places like Indonesia. But interest in this in initiative has waned, which is a pity. I think a strategic partnership must look beyond short-term considerations and difficulties and find some ways to put such collaborative efforts on a more sustainable and long-term footing. The world is in a period of increasing volatility, uncertainty and complexity. During this time, some major global wicked problems like climate change, free trade, energy and food security will need to be addressed. If they are neglected, or at best, managed in a suboptimal way, the likelihood is that we will experience more frequent crises, compelling costly crisis responses, rather than trying to avoid or mitigate such crises. And the danger for us is if we only rely on a few, perhaps brittle, overarching global institutions. As mentioned by my colleague Chiwi Kyung, a regional architecture defined by a network of groupings centered on ASEAN has emerged in the Asia-Pacific over the last four plus decades. And the US is an important part of this architecture. Although these groupings have often been dismissed by critics as talk shops with little impact, the regional architecture in the Asia-Pacific of untidy, overlapping groupings may well prove to be more effective in organizing relationships where there is great diversity and several centers of power. And it has played a non-insignificant role in dealing with some major global challenges. One important regional response to the 2008-2009 global financial and economic crisis was the multilateralization of the Chiang Mai Initiative and the subsequent establishment of ASEAN Plus 3 Macroeconomic uh, Research Office, or AMRO, in Singapore to monitor emerging threats to financial stability in the region. And they are examples of how a regional approach can sometimes work faster and better than a global approach in which it takes far longer time to forge agreement and reach consensus. Of course, this cannot solve all problems. But the various elements in the regional architecture engage all the major players and have the intrinsic value of promoting dialogue and consultation in a multilateral setting that might not be able to be done bilaterally. While the US is clearly not at the center of the regional architecture, ASEAN is, I submit that it actually has a deep and abiding interest in supporting the regional arch architecture and participating actively in it. But the problem for the US is that it is a member of some of these forums, but not all of them. And it seems to me that for the US to operate effectively in this regional architecture, it is vital that other countries that are members of all forums, such as Singapore, have a good appreciation of what the US views and interests are, their breadth and limits, and the reasons for them. Vice versa, it is important that the US understands in turn the interests of the individual countries that are. And I would add that this applies equally to other non-ASEAN countries, whether it's China or India or Japan, that are present in some forums but are absent from others. But acquiring an understanding of US views and interests, and vice versa, can only happen if there is regular dialogue and consultation. In this regard, the announcement last week of to institutionalize the senior officials dialogue between state and MFA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Singapore, is an important step in building a 21st century strategic partnership. But dialogue between diplomats is not enough. A 21st century strategic partnership should not be narrowly cast. Instead, it should be as broadly based as possible. This is because the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities may come from left field risks. Some of these left field risks, such as global pandemics, cyber threats, 
already penetrating the mainstream economy with real cost for governments, they are linked to shifts that we may not yet fully recognize, such as climate change or global population growth, that have downstream implications for resources, health, fiscal policy, so on. They could emerge to be game changers, and looking out for them and then dealing with them ought to be an imperative of all governments and require broader dialogues involving more agencies coming together to share information and wider collaborative mechanisms to strengthen collective action. How to structure such broad-based dialogues should be part of the effort to develop a 21st century partnership. Thank you. That was, that was wonderful, and the focus on uh, <coughs> thinking about uh, power in, in, in the context of networks. You were singing my song. It was a particularly uh, wonderful presentation. I, I think uh, Kurt Campbell's going to speak sitting. I think we'll let him do that. He's probably That's right. the first time he's had a chance to sit down <laughs> a, yeah. in quite some time. Well, Go ahead. Um, first of all, uh, let me uh, thank our uh, host today, uh, the Center for Strategic International Studies, and I want to thank in particular uh, Murray and Ernie for just a terrific program that uh, has really uh, served as the centerpiece for so much work that is being done, not just on Asia, but in particular on Southeast Asia, and for all the institutions and uh, groups that support it. Uh, thank you and congratulations for this uh, very uh, good work. It's also an honor to be with uh, Anne Marie Slaughter. I had a great fortune to really work under her to be able to support the work that she and the Secretary did uh, over the course of the last several years, and she has been an inspiration to many of us in terms of her academic and intellectual leadership at Princeton, at the State Department, and then whatever she decides to do uh, next. And then also to my good friend Tommy Coe, thank you for your many years of Peter Ho, Peter Ho sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That, that part's Lucky. off the record, sorry. <laughs> Lucky I have no ego. I'm I know, thank, thank God. That's one of the great things. Thank you, for, uh, thank you very much for your service that you've given, uh, given our relationship for many years. I, I've had a chance to be briefed a little bit on the preceding discussion over the course of the last um, couple of hours. And, and I think before I get into some specifics associated with the task at hand, which is really um, the uh, path forward for the U.S.-Singaporean relationship. I think I want to say three things about the overall uh, uh, arch of American foreign policy uh, in the Asian Pacific region. I think hopefully this will address some of the uh, issues and uh, discussions that I think uh, came up uh, uh, this morning. And in this respect, I'm just speaking for myself, but I believe in these issues uh, uh, very much, so I'm going to state them clearly. The great strength of, of uh, our Asia policy is that it is bipartisan. Uh, it has always been bipartisan, and my hope is that it will always be bipartisan. I think the key foundational aspects of our approach, our security commitments, our strong support to uh, uh, critical political relationships, uh, our uh, commitment to strong uh, trade and economic uh, engagement, I believe those are the foundations of our approach, and obviously we are entering a, um, a, a political period in the United States, and in fact, almost in, in many of the uh, key countries in the Asia Pacific, we're heading into uh, uh, important uh, political seasons. It's very important that we're careful um, uh, about our rhetoric, and I mean we, the general we. I think it's something we have to be sensitive to and um, careful about. Uh, secondly, uh, we never left Asia. Uh, the United States has been engaged uh, in Asia uh, consequentially for decades. Um, I do believe it is true that over the course of the last uh, many years that we have begun to step up our game in Asia, but that will be a long-term commitment that will take years, but we are also building on a very strong foundation. I must also say that one of the most critical components of that engagement was the uh, uh, partnership that the United States uh, began building with India. Uh, consequentially over the course of the last 10 years, beginning uh, in the Bush administration, also with the visit of President Clinton uh, uh, to India. So this is uh, important work, and it is necessarily bipartisan work. And when I say bipartisan, it also is the case that it is not simply work in the executive branch. As we work 
to fashion new relationships with key countries, particularly in Southeast Asia. For many years, these countries have been more engaged in many respects by the legislative branch than the executive branch. And so the nature of our engagement has to be whole of government in the sense not just the State Department and the White House and the Defense Department, but essentially all the key aspects of our executive and legislative branches, branches, and it needs to be bipartisan. I fundamentally believe that. I believe we will have a much better chance of uh, uh, national level success if we can keep those things in mind. And the last third point, Anne Marie, I would just simply say, I think it is incumbent upon the United States, and it is extraordinarily important that we go the extra mile to explain uh, and uh, uh, be very transparent to key countries about what our goals and ambitions are in the Asian Pacific region. Because I believe what we are uh, attempting to do is in the best interests of all countries in Asia. And uh, in particular, I want very much uh, next week when um, Vice President Xi visited, visits the United States, we take that opportunity and then subsequent opportunities to uh, uh, engage in a deep strategic discussion with China about uh, our role in the Asian Pacific and how we are determined uh, to work together. I believe it is our destiny for the United States and China to find ways to cooperate, to work closely together, and we want a strong partnership uh, with China. We want to work on a partnership that's more predictable, that's uh, based on the well-being of uh, each of our peoples, and uh, that is welcomed and supported by the surrounding region. And here, I'll get to this in the moment, when, you, when we look at the role of Singapore, it is this kind of advice that we have received consistently and quite consequentially, in my view, from, Singa from Singapore over the course of the last several years. I think before we look forward in any critical relationship, it's always important to look back and to both uh, to celebrate and also be honest about the kind of advice that we get from uh, a critical partner like uh, Singapore. What we have experienced uh, in my short time in government is a kind of uh, strategic advice and honesty that is rare in global politics. So for instance, I recall my colleague and friend Stanley Roth and I uh, uh, during the 1990s, during some of the most difficult periods of, of uh, challenges uh, with respect to uh, uprising in, in Indonesia before Admiral Blair went uh, down for his important visits. It was the Singaporeans who helped us, who gave us context, gave us suggestions about how to think about rebuilding this critical relationship with Indonesia and uh, explained to us how important it was to keep at it, to keep with it. Um, historically, uh, it has been uh, Singapore's uh, critical role to remind us of the role of balance in our relationship with our Chinese friends and how important it is to explain to them uh, uh, what we want to ac uh, accomplish, but also to be firm and clear about our goals and expectations. And I think it is that balance that has been an essential component of a successful engagement strategy uh, with China. Uh, over the course of the first years of the DPJ government uh, in uh, Japan, Quietly, it was Singapore, uh, although we were determined to maintain a close relationship and have a, uh, a patience about uh, uh, the um, uh, engagement. It was also the case that uh, uh, Singapore quietly urged us to remember that the, that the fulcrum, the essential uh, element in American engagement in Asia was the partnership with Japan, which we fully believe, but it's also uh, very good to have that reaffirmed uh, uh, by friends uh, on a regular basis. And then just on a number of other issues, when it came time for the United States to think about taking a more uh, engaged role in the ASEAN Regional Forum, when it came time to think about joining the East Asia Summit, the country more than any other that provided us the quiet, quiet guidance about how to think about it, how to provide the context about who we're you know, who we should talk to and in what way really it was Singapore. Uh, Australia played a very uh, important public role, but behind the scenes it was people uh, uh, like Peter, like Ambassador uh, Chan, who helped guide us through uh, sometimes a challenging thicket of uh, diplomatic concerns and uh, uh, guideposts that we had to be sensitive to. We are also finding in the current arena on a number of issues that Singapore's 
guidance and suggestions are central. Uh, uh, during a period where myself, I became very concerned and a little bit um, uh, pessimistic and even down, downbeat about the prospects of what could be, would be possible with Burma, with Myanmar. It was Singapore that quietly passed messages that urged us to continue, uh, to keep at it, to uh, continue a, a dialogue, even if it appeared at the outset that that effort was unsuccessful. And it has been Singapore that has given us encouragement that we have to be clear that we match the important steps that are taking place in Burma with our own steps. And uh, I think most recently with respect to the South China Sea, uh, uh, Singapore has been uh, uh, helpful in uh, ensuring that our very careful uh, 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 approach uh, is uh, well understood by the key uh, countries in the region and that we support uh, ASEAN uh, and a dialogue uh, between China and ASEAN going forward. So at almost every consequential uh, issue that we deal with, whether it's North Korea, whether it's India's increasing role in the Asian Pacific region, we probably listen more closely to advice and counsel from Singapore than any other country in Asia. And that is not an exaggeration. And, and, and that is a uh, fantastic base on which to build. So there, there are enormous things, and, and Peter has laid out some very consequential areas of military, of strategic, of political cooperation. But I must tell you that this foundation that has been established, and, and proceeding long before uh, my or uh, other people's roles, is a, a very uh, a strong foundation on which to build. And uh, I, I would uh, just like to offer a few of the things that I know Anne-Marie would like to open it up for discussion. Here are the areas that I think are going to be important as we go forward. I liked very much Peter's idea that any uh, fundamental strategic relationship has to be more diversified than simply kind of a State Department, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, line of communication. I agree with that. But I also believe that having a uh, foundation of a more formalized, structured set of interactions is critical going forward. So all one has to look in terms of American foreign policy is compare the nature of our interactions with Europe. They are multi-tiered. They're extraordinarily ritualized. We have enormous uh, uh, numbers of, of multilateral, minilateral, bilateral mechanisms that really keep our senior officials busy on a regular uh, basis. And if you compare until very recently Asia, Asia for a variety of reasons has remarkably few institutions. People often say, look, that, that the essence of American strategy is our, bipartisan, our bilateral relationships and then multilateral. But even our bilateral relationships, when you compare them to our European relationships, they have remarkably few mechanisms. Mechanisms actually serve the purpose to prepare agendas, to help us advance common agendas, and they discipline our respective bureaucracies. And, 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 and I know on the outside, that's, people are thinking, oh, that's just boring bureaucratic stuff. It is not. It is the essence uh, and fundamental um, uh, aspect of uh, progress in any relationship. And one of the things that Secretary Clinton and Marie played a huge role in institutionalized uh, uh, policy planning talks in Asia. One of the things that we want to be able to do with a host of countries is put in place more formal mechanisms of dialogue. So there is a regular basis. There is a tempo. There is a schedule. There is ex There are expectations about what uh, uh, two countries or a number of countries want to accomplish. And so even though that seems like the boring work of, of accountants, it is, it is my destiny. And so I, I work on this. I think it's important. And, and the hope is that we put in place a series of these kind of overlapping, interlocking institutions in Asia that keep us more actively engaged in building a stronger relationship. Secondly, I, I also agree with Peter that there's much to learn about uh, uh, from the United States about the, uh, the institutionalization of Asia. And he is also correct in stating that the United States is a member of some institutions, but not all. 
it is important for us to ensure that those institutions that we are not involved in directly, that our friends and partners keep us appraised, are aware of our interests and uh, seek to uh, promote them uh, and, and on occasion protect them uh, 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 when uh, those issues come up. But I'm also concerned about the institutions that we have joined and that we are playing uh, a larger role in. Uh, when Stan Stanley and I went to the ASEAN Regional Forum in the 1990s, we spent more time thinking about our performance than what we were going to do <laughs> in the actual meeting. That is the truth. But it has become, the ASEAN Regional Forum is a deeply consequential gathering now, much more so than it has been in recent years. And we have the Singaporeans to thank, helping uh, this uh, progression towards seriousness and a recognition that at the core of all of our multilateral engagement in Asia is ASEAN. Um, and so I, I believe that part of our challenge will be in deepening the responsibility and role of those institutions that we think are most consequential in Asia. And for me, that is the defense ministers meetings that are now moving, we hope, from a more uh, irregular once every th three years to a more regular uh, 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 set of uh, meetings and perhaps preparatory meetings. We are uh, very uh, uh, enthusiastic and supportive of the East Asia Summit. Uh, we believe the key here are deeper roots, not just broadening, not just extending membership and agendas, but deepening deeper dialogue. And the same is true of the ASEAN Regional Forum. And I believe that the next 10 years will be the most consequential period of institution building in Asia uh, that we've seen uh, uh, in 100 years. And I want the United States to be a critical partner in that role. And we will be better able to participate, to be able to play that subtle role of listening uh, as well as acting. Um, uh, with uh, the close consultation and support of our friends uh, in uh, Singapore. Next, I would also simply say that uh, we have seen some developments uh, again in Nepida, in, in Burma, in, in Myanmar, that no one would have anticipated six months ago. Uh, they are dramatic. Uh, they are shifting the nature of Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, the United States is strongly supportive of this effort. And we will need to work with countries in Southeast Asia so that we um, uh, temper our enthusiasm with also a recognition that more will need to be done. Um, and we will need to ensure that we have the support of others so that this historic opening can be continued. Um, uh, I'm, uh, again, very uh, hopeful. And I think you've heard what the President and Secretary Clinton and now Senator McConnell, Senator McCain, Senator Lieberman, when they've returned from their important trip, uh, trips to, uh, uh, to Burma, uh, the United States uh, is supportive of this effort. And we will want to take the appropriate diplomatic, uh, uh, political, and uh, assistance and economic steps in order to um, uh, make clear to the leadership that we recognize, appreciate, and uh, support uh, their uh, uh, steps towards reform. Um, let me just, if I could, uh, make uh, three last comments where I think Singapore can be essential. Obviously, right now, we're at a critical period uh, with respect to the TPP. And Singapore's role in that has been central. I also think, as we go forward, one of the fledgling institutions that we have now start, started to meet on a more regular basis is the US ASEAN Summit. And we've worked closely on people-to-people -people ties, on issues associated with uh, education and training. Uh, my own uh, view is that there has to be an economic component that's more far-reaching in this regard. And Singapore can assist us uh, in that process as we go forward, even with the recognition that our most uh, critical uh, uh, challenge in the, um, <coughs> in the current period is uh, TPP. Two last things, if I can. Um, second to last, uh, th there is a quality for all of you uh, would-be public servants uh, just to recognize about what it's going to be like to serve in government over the course of the next several years. Um, in the past, if you had a good idea and uh, you had the support for it, you could go up to Capitol Hill and you could say, look, let's come up with a plan of action. Let's find some money. Let's figure out how to, let's find resources. Let's figure out how to implement a good idea. 
I'm afraid for the next several years we'll be in a very different kind of environment in which we spend a lot of our time t trying to protect what we think are absolutely essential programs from uh, uh, the budget knife. And so my own experience in government right now that you can do a couple of different things. You can bemoan it, um, uh, you can fight it, uh, and I think you have to do a little bit of both. But it is also the case that I think going forward we, were, we are going to need to have many more innovative public-private partnerships, right? And I have to say some things that I'm proudest of, the things I've worked hardest on have been these public-private partnerships. And they have been working with other countries, with other organizations, with individuals. Emory was gracious enough to talk about the 100,000 strong. But that's just the beginning. In, in my own bureau, we have now 15 public-private partnerships. And just one other example, next, uh, in the next couple of months, we will announce a major gift to Japan. This is the 100th anniversary of the lovely 3,000 cherry trees that were given by Japan to the United States. Well, this year, we are going to respond and give 3,000 uh, uh, carefully uh, chosen uh, species of dogwoods to Japan. Uh, to be planted, uh, some around the, the tragic area that was hit by the earthquake, some planted around Tokyo as a remembrance and a signal of the respect and affection that Americans have uh, for Japanese, completely supported by uh, the private sector and others. I, I could go through many of these uh, specific agendas, but most particularly uh, at the U.S. ASEAN Summit, we announced a program very graciously supported uh, through very generous uh, uh, grant from Brunei to put large numbers, very large numbers of English teachers throughout Southeast Asia to Vietnam, to Laos, to Cambodia, to Burma. Um, and that program uh, is more than we can do right now, but it will allow a huge number of lives to be affected by people, Americans on the ground teaching English. And when you listen to ASEAN friends, they will tell you that it is this quality, the fact that so many friends, so many young people want to learn English, is a great ticket for us into the big game. Lastly, and I'm sorry to go on so long, um, I've always been struck by the vision of, of the key players in uh, Singapore. And you experience that all day today with every, from your foreign minister, from all your ministers who have visited, and, and from Peter. I have to tell you my own personal experience of this, uh, the most interesting conversation I've ever had on climate change was with a minister mentor. And it was several years ago in which uh, Anne-Marie knows I was working on this. I was thinking about what the national security foreign policy uh, implications of climate change, not might be, will be, right? And it was the minister mentor who more than any other person started talking about some of the extraordinarily difficult challenges of environmental refugees and the nature of the kinds of protections and the balance between trying to curtail emissions but also deal with the inevitable adjustments that are going to be necessary. Unbelievably far-reaching, you know, incredibly incisive, uh, uh, careful, analytic, uh, but also uh, remarkably strategic. Uh, I look forward to working with Singaporeans on challenges like climate change and those things that lurk just over the horizon that are coming into the consciousness of uh, sort of modern day strategic thought. Just in conclusion, I, I can't uh, say enough about how much we value the relationship. Um, uh, I can't tell you always, my particular counterpart is Bellahari, uh, uh, Bellahari San, as I refer to him as. Um, if, if you have a thin skin, better to stay out of the room. Uh, it, it, uh, he is wonderfully honest in his critiques and assessments about uh, the failings and occasional trip-ups of American foreign policy. But it is remarkably valuable to hear straight talk about from a country that wants the United States to be engaged and to do better. What more can you ask for? Thank you.
difference would you uh, emphasize? Uh, thank you. Well, you know, the relationship between the Singapore and the United States uh, is based on a long history of uh, cooperation and I think over many decades we have uh, built up uh, many areas of uh, strong cooperation. So that's a foundation for any kind of uh, partnership uh, going forward in uh, offering the idea of looking at Singapore as a hub rather than just looking at Singapore as a country. Uh, the idea is to open up new possibilities of how you might conceivably uh, extend and expand an already rich relationship. With China, it is a bit different because we do not have that same long history of uh, cooperation. Yet, going forward, we do have a, a, a very important uh, relationship. It's important for political reasons. It's important for uh, economic reasons is important for strategic reasons is important because China is very much part of the region that we live in so with China I would say we uh, start from a lower base and therefore we need to build it up but I would say that uh, the same considerations which uh, we apply to the US apply to some extent uh, to uh, China we want to build up the economic relationship, the trade relationship. We want to be more coordinated on matters pertaining to uh, uh, fiscal uh, policies. We want to uh, have more dialogue because we need to understand how the Chinese think. And that's one of the areas where I think uh, all countries uh, face uh, some obstacles in trying to understand Chinese thinking and Chinese views. We would like to have more structured dialogue with them. Now, all the attributes of Singapore as a hub could also apply to China. I'm not sure whether we are ready or the Chinese are ready to do it. We are ready probably, but the question is, are the Chinese ready? Now, when I offered the idea of Singapore as a hub to the US, I think we are ready with the US or the US should be ready. With China, well, if they are ready, I think we are ready also to run with them. So this is what I meant by with uh, important friends and partners. We should have a special relationship if it is going to be a strategic relationship, but it cannot be an exclusive relationship because we are a hub and we have big interests with other, with other countries as well. But we will make sure that our strategic interests with uh, the United States are strengthened as far as we can. But as they say, it takes two to clap. And for us to move <laughs> forward on this, it really also requires uh, some uh, positive signals from the US that it wants to bring that relationship uh, forward. And of course, all Kurt's remarks are very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the floor is open. Please wait for the microphone uh, and then uh, state your name and make sure it's a question. Imol Skoden. Um, we have heard a lot today from lots of speakers, and I think appropriately, about the good advice Singapore gives the U.S. about the role it would like America to play, what the U.S. should be doing. Um, I wonder if you could flip that. When you have these real straight talk conversations for Secretary Campbell, what are you telling Singapore about the role you would like it to start playing in terms of, or, or continue playing in some cases, in terms of strategic issues like the future of ASEAN, uh, how we react to growing Chinese nationalism, even some global issues, or for Peter Ho, what do you hear from the Americans in that sense? Where does that straight talk uh, lead when it comes from the American side? Kurt, why don't you start? Yeah, I, I will, I will. Thank you, Emil. Thank you for the question. Um, can, can I just, just I want to just, I thought uh, Anne-Marie's question um, to Peter was very good. And I, I would simply say, just on this particular issue, that, and I spent at least a little bit of time in Asia now, I, I, I would say <laughs> at a general level, um, one of the most important features of Asia is that every country in Asia right now wants a better relationship with China. Every, every country does, and that's natural. And, and any American strategy in the region has to be based on that fundamental recognition. That is also the case that every country in Asia, I believe, also wants 
a better relationship with the United States. And I think that's also natural, and we want that to be encouraged and supported uh, by China as well. And I think what, what, what Singapore and other countries often will say is let's make sure that we create the circumstances that you just need to speak. Mine, more mine's on. I, sorry, it's on. Uh, let's make sure that 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 countries are not put in a circumstance where they have to choose in such a way that hurts their interests. So we support that. We think a, a, a deeper, stronger dialogue uh, uh, between uh, countries and China is a good thing and something to be encouraged. Uh, let me just say, when we meet with Singaporeans, it is a very much a two-way uh, conversation. We talk about a variety of things. Uh, they, I think I feel more comfortable, honestly, telling you the advice that we receive than, uh, than the advice that we give. Uh, but it is very much respectful. It's very much two-way. Um, and, and it is, I, I would also say, and I, I probably should have mentioned this, it, it's not just the advice, it's the assessment of what's, what is transpiring. In fact, it is that that is probably as important as anything else, is like being able to look at a situation. What I, what I like about Singaporeans is that they're rational and they're strategic. And so they can take a problem and they can turn it on its side and look at it from a number of perspectives. And so we can look at the, at the economic crisis. We can look at the implications of the nuclear disaster in Japan. We can consider uh, the role of deeper institutions in ASEAN and what that might mean, and then, and then think about it constructively for an extended period. That is as valuable as anything that we do. All right. There. Thanks. Aaron Connolly from uh, Albright Stonebridge Group. I was wondering if I could ask a question about Singapore's largest neighbor, Indonesia. Uh, it seems that we're about to go through a period where uh, the success that we've had in the last few years, uh, which has been terrific, uh, all the low-hanging fruit has been picked at this point. There's certainly more that we can do, but Indonesia is about to enter a very early election or political season. They're taking off after us in that way. Um, <laughs> and so I'm wondering if there's any advice uh, from the Singaporean side in particular, recognizing that uh, Indonesians are often very sensitive to the role of Singapore in Indonesia. Uh, that we can do to move the relationship forward and to continue to move the relationship forward uh, through 2014 and, and into the next five-year period. Thank you. Great. Well, really, you should be addressing this question to our ambassador to Indonesia because he's the real Indonesian uh, expert. But since I'm sitting up here on the podium, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give, you, give you my best uh, shot. Now, Indonesia has made... Uh, uh, enormous strides in, in recent years, and I think it is on a, a much better uh, footing now uh, than it was, uh, say, uh, 12, uh, 15 years ago when the uh, Asian financial uh, crisis hit. So there's uh, a lot more confidence uh, that the political transition has uh, taken root and uh, uh, the uh, democracy uh, uh, is, I think, gone through enough transitions for them to feel that it is a system that, uh, with uh, some fine-tuning, is uh, basically working. So investments are coming back into Indonesia. Now it looks as if uh, e uh, economists are looking uh, at uh, some favor with uh, Indonesia. So it is beginning to see itself as uh, a country that is going to play a major role uh, in the region and in the world. Now, I would say uh, Indonesia for the United States must, by definition, be an important uh, partner. It is a major player in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, it is going to have influence in the regional architecture which we have uh, spoken about, and it's also increasingly playing a role on the global stage in uh, uh, groupings like the G20. Now what is to me very important is you engage Indonesia, not just Indonesia as uh, uh, one of the potential BRICI countries, you know they've got this uh, 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 acronym which are brick, but they've ad added I into that. Either it's either B R I I C or B R I C I. But whatever it is, you know, 
you will engage Indonesia at one level as a member of uh, that uh, group of emerging and strong, medium-sized global economies. But I think it is also important to remember that Indonesia is also very much at the center of the region. It's at, uh, a major player within ASEAN, and it's also important that it is engaged as part of that. Because if you neglect that, then you weaken ASEAN, and you also therefore weaken the very regional architecture that keeps some kind of order in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. So I would, uh, my advice to you is, yes, by all means, go ahead and engage Indonesia, but engage it at all levels, not just you know, at the level where it's in the big league of uh, big and medium-sized economies. Engage Indonesia as part of ASEAN, as part of Southeast Asia, because that is very important. Thank Great. you. Yes, actually, uh, Mexico likes Brick Sam, where you add South Africa and, and Mexico. There was a question right here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mickey Spiegel from Human Rights Watch. Um, I, as you well know, there are uh, human rights um, restrictions and problems in Singapore. And what I'm wondering is in the course of defining a strategic relationship for the 21st century, will those issues be a part of that negotiation, basically? I would add further, are they, since that those negotiations are already in progress, is our human rights on the agenda now? And if not, why not? Thank you. Uh, I mean, as you say, that uh, that that, that there are some issues between Singapore and the U.S. on the human rights. There's this uh, report published. I, I forget. I, I, I'm a retiree, so I, I, my memory isn't. Uh, what is it? No, the the the, the the no, not trafficking persons. There's this annual. Uh, oh, the human rights human report. Right, there's the annual human rights report, which is uh, published, and uh, uh, it's it's published every year. You know, the the United States will. Uh, we open our books. The United States is free to draw conclusions from what it reads. We believe that many of the conclusions it draws are wrong. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, on things like this, we're adult enough to know uh, uh, when to agree to disagree. And so I think if you talk about a uh, strategic partnership in the 21st century, yes, of course, we will discuss issues like human rights in private and sometimes when these issues like this annual human rights report come up, it will be a public uh, debate. But this is not the centerpiece of our uh, any bilateral strategic relationship. This will be one of an issue in a whole cluster and a whole spectrum of issues that we will have to discuss. And in the end, it's a strategic partnership. I'm not saying these are unimportant, but at the end of the day, what are the most important uh, strategic reasons for having a strong relationship between the two countries. So we must know how to put this in their proper place in the scheme of things. Not saying it's unimportant, but you know we have to uh, have a broader perspective of that relationship. So we will continue to discuss issues like human rights, and I suspect we will agree to disagree on certain things, but on many things pertaining to human rights, I think they will converge over time. Kurt, do you want yeah, to If I just, um, and I, maybe just a slightly different take than Peter, but I, I very much respect his, his views on this. I, I think the key is not where it stacks up in the hierarchy, but the manner in which it's discussed, to be honest. And so, yes, we do have quiet discussions on every uh, possible issue, but I think it's extremely important given the remarkable accomplishments of a country like Singapore, um, that the United States deal and interact in the most respectful possible ways in these sorts of interactions. And at least when I'm involved, that's how I try to do it, and that's how I'll, I'll continue to do it. So I don't think so much it's the hierarchy. It is how issues are addressed and how they are dealt with in the larger context of a remarkable uh, set of achievements and progress. Great. I'm going to take two last questions. or. 
I'm going to take one from you also. <laughs> go, go ahead, Ernie. Uh, question. <laughs> too hard. Too hard. Someone else. <laughs> I had my. I just wanted. I'm Ernie Bauer. I just wanted to ask both of you if you think there. Would you agree that um, having China integrated into this? You know, I, I had the same sort of same question you had, um, which was when you were talking, Peter. I thought you know he could be in Beijing right now. Make, make the same speech, and then I thought, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I thought, Speak into the mic. I, I thought it's a, probably a good thing. You know, uh, so I, the question is, would you, is the end goal of strategies that you both have and, and maybe share or, or maybe you don't share, is the end goal to have China t in as a full partner and integrated into uh, these, these goals that you described, Peter, trade, security, people to people, and and then if, if the answer is yes, is there enough ambition in our strategy uh, in that regard? I, I didn't hear a lot about it today. More you know, sort of worry and anxiety about it. And um, if the answer is no, uh, why not? Okay. Uh, well, uh, first I would say that in my experience, and you know, as, as, a, as a small country, we have to be realistic, we are a price taker. So we have learned very early on that politics is out of the possible. You only do what is, uh, what is uh, possible. And so with China, I think the ultimate goal must be to make sure that China is fully integrated, not just into the regional community, but into the global community. It's better to have China in than out. And that is why you know, we, we were very early and strong supporter of China's entry into the WTO. And I would say it, 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 that if we extend that approach and that principle, that uh, would apply. We, w we want uh, China in the global system playing a constructive and positive role, and we will do what it takes to get there because it is our interest, and uh, I, I, I suspect it's also in the interest of the United States. And if they are ready to talk about a strategic partnership with Singapore, we will have a strategic partnership with uh, Singapore. I would just, just add, I, I agree. I think it's in our interest to have China in and playing by the rules. And uh, uh, also, uh, and those rules are uh, uh, well established and I think uh, well defined and they have been they have served as the foundation for the most remarkable progress uh, in not only the history of Asia but the history of the world and and I think um, you know occasionally we uh, we hear concerns about containment I, I just I, I just that is just so far from what uh, and, and and by the way it is a it is a it is a unfortunate legacy of of the Cold War. I mean, the Soviet Union and China could not be more differ, different in terms of the kinds of roles they play and the regional context. Ultimately, uh, what we are seeking is not to contain China. We actually want China more engaged, but more engaged in ways that they are supporters of the. Um, the mechanisms and the institutions that have provided peace, prosperity, and stability for decades. All right. Now my, there's a question there and there's a question in the back. I'd like you to ask them both together and then we're going to uh, give our panelists a chance to respond and close up. Uh, Bernard Gordon, uh, University of New Hampshire. For Secretary Campbell, um, and you've just mentioned uh, the, uh, the relationship that I was going to ask you about with regard to TPP. We know, everybody in this room knows, and you have just stressed, that there is no element of containment. And the history of TPP, uh, going back to the early days of when it was a P3 and P4, yeah. tells us that. And yet, there is a widespread and growingly intensive view among Australians, among some Americans, Professor Mearsheimer at Chicago, Bhagwati, and just yesterday, the, the Asia Pacific Director of the, in China, the uh, uh, on uh, CASS uh, said directly that the goal of TPP is to contain China. So with the view in mind what the coming up next week of the uh, Chinese visitor, are there ways in which we can effectively uh, help the Chinese leadership understand that the TPP is not designed 
to contain China, because if that view continues, it will be probably very, very, uh, it would be very negative, obviously. While you're thinking of your answer, I'd let one a question from back there, and then I'm going to give it to both of you. Yeah, Th this is Kumar from Amnesty International. Uh, uh, Mr. Ho, you mentioned that some of the State Department's human rights reports are wrong. Would you mind uh, give one or two examples where State Department made mistakes in assessing Singapore's human rights record? Also, uh, Mr. Cam Secretary Cam Assistant Secretary Campbell, are you and Singapore, are you on the same page on South Sinai Sea, or you have difference of opinion how to deal with that? Oh, Thanks. That's a big last question. Uh, the last question was about the South China Sea. Uh, so, uh, Kirk, let me let you uh, start, and then I will turn to Peter, and you're free to offer any closing thoughts. Look, uh, look, uh, I mean, what's interesting about TPP, just, I mean, you've been involved, sir, much longer than I have, but it was only eight months ago or so where people were saying, you know, the United States does not have a trade strategy. Yeah. You're not engaged in Asia economically. You've got to show us what you've got. You haven't been able to pass the Korea Free Trade Agreement. You've made no real progress. Uh, on any major initiative. And now, TPP is a massive, you know, kind of containment mechanism. And so, <laughs> I, 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 you know, eight months later, look, I, I would simply say that uh, this is an important, innovative trade uh, uh, opportunity that we're excited about. This is, this is not by invitation, it is by aspiration, right? And so we've been very clear about that going forward. Uh, and uh, I strongly believe that we will be able to make the case uh, next week uh, when uh, Vice President Xi uh, visits that in every arena we are supporting an active, strong engagement with China. Let us recall that one of the countries that was most supportive of the G20, which when we talk about Asian institutions, sometimes we forget the G20, but remember the G8 had a, still has a remarkably European focus. The G20, half of its membership are in the Asian Pacific region. So it's enormously important. And in fact, we support Singapore being able to come and participate uh, uh, actively uh, in, in the meetings as well. So I, uh, I believe fundamentally it will be in our interests to try to make clear the areas where we want to cooperate, where we want to work together in every aspect of bilateral and multilateral engagement. And uh, I will also say about TPP that the real challenges ahead are it's hard to negotiate a trade agreement without uh, fast track authority. It really is. It's remarkably difficult. And so, so our real challenges is not, are, are just to see if we can, you know, take the necessary steps with our partners and friends who are involved in this effort going forward. On the South China Sea, I think, look, I'm not going to repeat, our, our position is very carefully laid out, exact, precise words. I'm not going to go through that. But I will say we do believe right now that the primary venue uh, of, uh, of international engagement is the diplomacy that is ongoing uh, uh, between China and ASEAN. We support that. Um, we do believe that, you know, based on appropriate international legal mechanisms, the general, uh, 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 you know, overarching uh, agreement that, t that Singapore and others have about the need to maintain peace and stability, uh, to ensure that disputes are settled peacefully and without coercion. Those are the foundations for how to deal with a very challenging uh, set of issues going forward. Thank you. Peter. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, first on your specific question regarding uh, the Human Rights Report, since everything is on the record and my memory is very bad and I've been out of the system for close to one and a half years, I suggest you just go and look up uh, uh, one of the press releases where every, everything is uh, laid out uh, very clearly. You will know where uh, the Singapore government stands on, the, uh, on these uh, matters. Uh, regarding the South uh, China Sea, uh, I, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, Singapore, like uh, uh, any country with uh, an interest in A, uh, free sea lines of communication and B, a peaceful region, wants a, a constructive and peaceable approach to dealing with the disputes in the South China Sea. That's why the so-called DOC, the Declaration of Intent on the Code of Conduct, is so important. But 
it's clearly not going to be the easy process of getting a quick agreement because first it requires the 10 ASEAN countries to agree and second it needs uh, 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 an approach and a willingness to settle things uh, with the uh, Chinese. What's important I guess is in spite of the fact that it's a slow and painful process is the process of discussion and dialogue is still going on among all the uh, countries. Thank you. Peter, when you were speaking, you said that a 21st century strategic partnership needed to go far beyond governments. I think we all agreed. If that's right, this dialogue is very much a part of the 21st century strategic partnership. The relationships that are built, the issues that are discussed openly, uh, frankly, uh, that's exactly the kind of broader partnership that we need to forge, and I thank CSIS, uh, and I certainly thank our panelists for a very interesting final panel. Thank you. Okay, because I can't.